Uh, good evening. So, uh, yes, uh, basically this is a project that was sort of started uh, a couple of months ago at a hackathon that was organised by me and a few other people. And basically, yes, without further ado, we'll begin. So, uh, if you haven't heard of the analytical engine, it was invented by Charles Babbage, uh, almost 200 years ago, not quite. And basically, uh, it's an entirely mechanical computer. It's never been built yet. People are currently working on it, so there might be a physical implementation soon. And uh, yes, uh, amongst his other various accomplishments, he solved the Visionaire cipher. So that was uh, a cryptographic system that was believed to be unbreakable. And yes, that's one of the other marvelous things that he did. But in particular, he hosted soirees at his mansion in London. And uh, just in case you haven't seen one of them, there's a kind of high level design of what a soiree looks like. Uh, yes, except the main difference is he had a mechanical, well, uh, showcased this mechanical computer that he built. So this is a Lego model courtesy of Tim Hutton, uh, which adds together two single digit decimal integers. So the way that it works is you can see there are two wheels over here with uh, the numbers written on them and they're connected together by uh, gears that are meshed together. So if you crank the handle, one of the numbers will go up, the other will go down whilst retaining the same sum. And when one of them is equal to zero, you read off the number from the other wheel and it's added together those two numbers. Obviously, adding together single digits is pretty trivial, so uh, ideally, what we, you would have is a stack of these. So if you wanted to add together six-digit numbers, you would have a stack of six of these gears on each side. And if you look at the left-hand uh, wheel, there's an arm on that. And when that rotates round to zero, it acts as a carry mechanism, so it knocks the gear that's directly above and allows it to propagate. Charles Babbage actually designed a much more sophisticated way of getting it so that the carry propagates up instantly instead of taking time to ripple up. But uh, that's sort of an irrelevant detail. Uh, but yes, uh, that's addition. What if we want to do something more complex? What if we want to compute, say, the sequence of cubes? Now, the naive one, the way of doing this would be uh, for each integer to multiply it by itself uh, twice so that you get uh, the cube of that. But if you want to compute the entire sequence rather than just a single value, it's more efficient to compute it as a sequence. So the way you do that, or uh, a particular way of doing it, is you note that that's a polynomial sequence of degree three. So if you take successive differences, as I've done there, uh, the next row is a polynomial of degree two. Uh, so you get each thing on the top row by adding the previous term to the thing below it. So that reduces the problem to computing a second degree polynomial. In turn, you can reduce that to computing a linear polynomial and ultimately computing a constant, which is no work whatsoever. So basically, Charles Babbage's difference engine was a realization of this as a machine that operates using the uh, addition machine there. Uh, and it could compute seventh degree polynomials by having, uh, no, actually, sorry, sixth degree polynomials by having uh, seven of these uh, rows, uh, well, columns in the, as in this, uh, a, a stack of gears for each one of the variables. And actually, uh, it was surprisingly advanced considering the fact that uh, naively you would start at the bottom. Uh, do an addition and keep moving up. 
Charles Babbage realised that it's possible to speed that up by doing uh, all of the even numbered rows simultaneously and then all of the odd numbered rows. So I think that's the first time parallel computing was actually invented, at least in this sense. But yes, uh, this is basically a summary, and to the right you can see uh, a fragment that was actually constructed within Babbage's lifetime and showcased at the aforementioned soiree. The reason for this difference engine was uh, if you can compute polynomials, then you can locally produce tables of logarithms which are useful for navigation, etc. Also, whilst, uh, well, at this particular soiree, uh, lots of various dignitaries came to the party, uh, one of whom was Ada Lovelace. Yes. So she celebrated her 200th birthday last month, actually, uh, hence why we hosted the hackathon. And her father was Lord Byron, who was a bit of a rapscallion. In particular, he kept a pet bear whilst a student at Trinity. In fact, uh, he was reprimanded for this uh, and called in front of the dean who said, uh, for, uh, you're not allowed to have domesticated animals in your room, to which his response was, I assure you it's quite wild. Uh, anyway, as a result of this, Ada's mother insisted that uh, she, uh, well, they both escape from Lord Byron and that she learn mathematics on the basis that it's as far away from poetry in her mind as uh, anything else. So uh, the idea is if she learns mathematics, it will prevent her from becoming insane. I'm not sure exactly how that follows. Uh, but yes, basically... So, the analytical engine is a much more complicated machine, as you can see. In fact, it's basically the first design of a computer that nowadays we would call Turing complete, although this was long before Turing was even born. So, the uh, cylindrical thing to the right-hand side is the mill, which is the arithmetic logic unit and it could do all of the four elementary operations. You can see various things reading punched card, which is uh, how the program was entered into the machine. This was never built, by the way, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, extending off considerably far into the left is the memory, which is a thousand column store, so it can store a thousand variables, each of which is a 50-digit decimal integer with a sign bit as well. Uh, yes, it supported looping and conditional branches on the uh, uh, tapes of punched card. So it's possible to make it repeat operations, uh, jump potentially to subroutines and things, but you have to do a little work to be able to uh, do that. And it inspired the design of a Harvard Mark I which was actually built, and that was an electromechanical computer, uh, sort of around a similar time as Colossus and the ENIAC and all of those things. In particular, and I can't stress this enough, the instructions are kept on punched cards separate from the memory, which is in the thousand column store. So even though there are huge constraints on the amount of memory that you can store, as we'll see later, that doesn't affect the maximum length of a program. That's just however much space you have to store a punched card. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, Sometimes people confuse these two machines, uh, which is a bit of a travesty. Fortunately, this quote from Ada Lovelace should set it straight, that the difference engine can only do arithmetic, whereas the analytical engine is capable of doing much more because it's fully programmable. And we'll see later some of the things that she'd envisaged for it. Oh, yes. Uh, Sort of putting it in context, these weren't the first computers, even though the analytical engine was the first during complete one. So uh, about 2,000 years before that was the Antikythera mechanism, which was discovered recently. Uh, 
later were just calculators, basically, by Pascal and Leibniz. And then the ones invented by Babbage were never built in their entirety. Oh, yes. Uh, thanks go to Simon Rawls for actually drawing this uh, diagram at the hackathon. So, variables are kept in the store, which acts as the memories, as I've mentioned, and they're transferred onto the ingress axis, uh, which copies them into the mill, which is uh, ALU, basically. Uh, there, uh, according to microprograms, it can do things like add the numbers together, multiply them, divide, etc. The results taken off of the egress axis, and then, uh, according to a punched card, you can tell it to save that at a particular value in a particular position in the store. A considerably neater and more compl uh, complicated diagram by Charles Babbage. This is from his notes, and basically. You see the resemblance. <laughs> anyway, yes. Uh, the memory, as I've mentioned, are a thousand columns, each storing a 50 digit signed integer. Uh, compared with modern computers, you can work out exactly how much RAM it's got. And it's slightly more than a Sinclair spectrum, but not by much. So, uh, compared with modern computers which have about a million times this, it's quite restrictive. Speed's also an issue. So uh, Babbage estimated, even before it had been built, how quickly this could perform computations and subject to uh, basic physical limitations, it takes about a second to do an addition and a minute to do either a multiplication or a division. Uh, in modern parlance, we would say that it's 16 milliflops, although that's, that's kind of a misnomer because these are fixed point operations rather than floating point. But either way, milliflops is quite a satisfying word to say. So yes, uh, Ada Lovelace, amongst her accomplishments, actually predicted uh, the information age, as it were. In particular, whereas Babbage had only conceived his machine for uh, calculation, Ada Lovelace uh, noticed that you could equivalently manipulate, for example, sound by encoding the sequence of notes as numbers, operating upon them uh, mathematically with this machine. And in particular, that it could potentially be used to compose music. She did, however, not entirely predict the AI revolution that's coming up. In particular, she said that the analytical engine can only do what we know how to perform and can't uh, anticipate any truths of its own. S but you may think of that as an obstacle. I decided to take it as a challenge instead. So yes. Uh, Basically, the most promising model that's most well adapted to the analytical engine uh, in terms of the fact that it's uh, arithmetic is a neural network. So chances are quite a lot of you have probably seen these in previous talks. But if you haven't, uh, information flows from the left-hand side of the diagram to the right-hand side. Uh, these sort of cobweb things are where every node here is connected to one in the following layer. And in particular, each of these edges have weights assigned. Uh, they can be positive or negative. And sort of a motivation behind neural networks is if, uh, say, you wanted to uh, create a neural network to predict the weather or whatever, you would have as inputs, things that you can directly observe, then there are some intermediate values. Uh, you can think of these as being Boolean things, although in reality this operates by fuzzy logic because there's a certain degree of uncertainty. So if you suppose the top uh, thing in the middle layer might be the prediction that it's going to rain tomorrow, it could be 
uh, but one of these inputs is there are lots of clouds in the sky, in which case you would have a positive weight because it's more likely to rain if that were the case. Uh, if uh, one of the inputs was, say, uh, we're currently in the Sahara Desert, then you would have a huge negative weight, uh, and so on. And then, yes, uh, I've drawn these non-linearity things. Basically, there are two ways to motivate that. So, uh, you would want linearity because if you don't have that, then this can only compute a linear function, so that's uh, massively restrictive. Another sort of more natural way of motivating why we have that particular activation function. So uh, I've drawn a graph of a function. Basically, uh, if you plot the output, it goes between minus 1, meaning certainly false, to plus 1, meaning certainly true. I've decided to go for that over uh, uh, sorry, the usual 0 and 1, because uh, it tends to help training if you do it this way. Uh, also, it's nice and symmetrical. Uh, certain things you would notice about this. Firstly, it's monotonic, so the more positive the input is, the more positive the output is, which should be the case, as in uh, the more evidence that you're given to believe something's true, the more convinced you should be that it's true. So, uh, also the reason that it plateaus off is you can't really get any more certain than completely certain. So if you were trying to determine whether someone was guilty of a crime and you had lots of positive evidence, say, uh, DNA, fingerprinting, etc., then you'd be convinced beyond any reasonable doubt. So if someone gave you even more evidence, you would still just be absolutely convinced. Yes, uh, MNIST is a problem which is particularly amenable to neural networks and other forms of uh, machine learning that's difficult to do just by telling the computer what to do. Oh yes, that's what I forgot to mention. Uh, the weights aren't programmed in beforehand, they're randomly initialised and based on how well it does, uh, you feed back the information through that and update the weights accordingly. So yes, uh, can a machine recognise handwritten digits? Well, firstly, we need it in a format that a machine can understand. So we'll have a bunch of pixels, say 25 by 25, in which case we have 625 inputs on the left-hand side. I've only drawn eight, but it would take too long to draw 625. Uh, then, say, 30 in the middle. Uh, it, uh, Basically, the more you have, the longer it takes to learn, but potentially the more accurate it can be. And then 10 outputs, so uh, an output for each possible value. And you just take the one that produces the strongest output as being the value that you suspect it to be. There's now a question of what do we use for the activation function. So if we recall, uh, we use, uh, well, Tanch is a standard one. And it has a few nice properties, as I've mentioned. Uh, monotonicity, so uh, as you move right, it goes, it strictly goes up instead of going down at all. Uh, symmetry, I've also mentioned, and saturation. So it saturates at minus one for huge negative inputs and plus one for huge positive inputs. The only problem is with the analytical engine, we don't have a tanch function. We only have addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So, one thing that, uh, so ideally, what you want to have is a rational function with that property. So, one where you're only using those operations. And uh, at least on the, uh, in the positive x direction, this looks quite nice. It does satisfy monotonicity and saturation. The only problem is, if you look at what it does for negative values, it's abysmal. So you want it to be symmetric about the origin, but it just rushes off to minus infinity and does even more path pathological stuff back there. So at first I thought, oh no, this is going to present basically a problem that can't be overcome because 
any rational function has a property that uh, it can only have one horizontal asymptote, so it can't saturate both plus one at one side and minus one at the other. So, well, ideally, as I say, the thing you want to do is take the positive uh, part of it and just flip it round and stitch it on and hope that you can do that. Fortunately, you can by using the absolute value function. Uh, admittedly, the analytical engine doesn't have this built in, which means we have to implement it ourselves. So this is uh, code uh, written in a way that the analytical engine can understand. So uh, the first four instructions basically uh, copies the value, from one, uh, value x from one register to another by adding zero to it because due to a limitation, in order to copy values, you have to do it by a dummy operation such as adding zero. Taking the absolute value, you need to do a conditional jump. And uh, I was quite pleasantly surprised to find that you can compute absolute value just using five instructions by doing a subtraction and storing the result but uh, storing the result of subtracting it from zero back in the original register if and only if the result is positive. And then the other stuff. Uh, the main thing to notice is in the division, we have to do a logical bitwise or digitwise shift to account for the fact that uh, the analytical engine only does integer arithmetic, so if we want to uh, emulate real arithmetic, we have to uh, handle the fixed points and everything. Unfortunately, that activation function works not particularly well. So if you look at the Tanch function, uh, that gets up to nearly 97% accuracy. Whereas this new activation function only gets up to 93%. Why is that? Well, we should look at the comparative shape of them. And you can see there's a huge difference. Specifically, Tanch saturates very quickly, whereas uh, this sort of poor approximation doesn't. So basically, we need to slightly alter the function that we're using. And we do this by replacing x with x plus 2x cubed. And this time, if you plot it, it looks almost indistinguishable. And the results from training are also almost indistinguishable. So that's good. Yes, the only problem is, uh, using a simple neural network, we have uh, 625 inputs, 30 intermediate neurons. That means in the first layer alone, we have 18,000 independent weights. And when you've only got 20 kilobytes of RAM, that's completely infeasible. So yes, we need to reduce that somehow. One thing to note is the model we've considered doesn't respect the spatial structure of a digit. So if we go back to the picture of the digit, it's clearly a 25 by 25 array. We can see that, and we can recognize the digit 9 quite easily with it being presented in this format. If we were just presented these 625 values in a random order with no uh, spatial structure, it would be a lot more difficult to learn how to recognize digits. So, yes, the idea of a convolutional neural network uh, is if you imagine these blue spheres at the bottom to be your input image, and the green cylinders to be the next neurons. Uh, they're spatially arranged, so uh, it learns features locally. They're only dependent on pixels that are arranged locally. And also, yes, another thing to note is firstly, we've vastly reduced the number of connections by having it so that uh, in this case, each green cylinder is only connected to nine of the blue spheres instead of all 625. Uh, 
Also, another way that we reduce the amount of information is the weights that we use are shared between all of the green cylinders. The idea being, if you uh, learn how to recognise a vertical line somewhere in the image, it's also useful to be able to recognise vertical lines elsewhere. It makes it much faster to train as well. Of course, we have a 25 by 25 uh, input layer, so you have to scale it up accordingly. Oh, I forgot to mention these red cuboid things basically uh, are what's known as a pooling layer. So uh, once you've recognised that there's a feature somewhere in your image, it doesn't matter exactly at which pixel it's located. If it's off slightly, it doesn't matter. You just want to know roughly where it is. So uh, we... Uh, after identifying uh, the probability that there exists, a, uh, say, a horizontal line at each point in the image, we then sort of take the maximum over two by two regions. And it simplifies the results because now the output's only a 10 by 10 feature map instead of a 20 by 20. Also, the way convolutional neural networks work is you need to have multiple feature maps because just being able to identify horizontal edges isn't particularly useful. You want to at least be able to identify vertical ones and maybe some other things as well. So we might have five such layers uh, and then, so in other words, five of these uh, well, 10 by 10 in this. Uh, in the next model I consider, uh, I've done more pooling, so they're only 7 by 7. Uh, and after that, you have fully connected layers as before. So, diagrammatically, uh, sorry about <laughs> Comic Sans if anyone's offended by Comic Sans. Uh, we have a convolution on the left hand side, and then the usual fully connected malarkey to the right. And if you count the number of weights, most of the weights are actually in the fully connected layer rather than the convolutional one. So if you add up all the weights and biases for roughly 8,000, most of which are in this fully connected layer there. And I decided to run this, well, firstly implement it in C++ and then run it to see how well it does. And it actually beats the uh, original neural network. So not only does it have fewer internal variables, it's uh, much better. It gets up to, uh, well, at the end of uh, 24 epochs, it gets up to 98.2% accuracy compared with, it was 96.8, if you recall, from the earlier diagram. Admittedly, that's still not good enough to fit in the analytical engine because with 20 kilobytes of RAM, we'll only have about two bytes for each variable and not much left over, and we do need a lot left over. So we still need to improve that. How could we do that? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, Babbageable has kind of one word of the year, by the way. Uh, yes. Uh, we implement this by having two convolutional layers instead of one, and only one fully connected one at the end. Uh, I wasn't really very sure that this would work, because usually in all of the uh, machine learning introductions I've seen, they always have at least two fully connected layers at the end. Surprisingly, it beats the previous one. You actually get 98.5% accuracy with a little over 2,000 variables. So that's all well and good, but it would be nice to actually have an implementation of this rather than just a theoretical result that says it's possible. So fortunately, in one of the deep corners of the internet, there's an emulator for the analytical engine. And, uh, well, that's how we were able to uh, test, for example, that... Uh, where is it? But this code works because you can run it in the emulator. Uh, unfortunately, 
Uh, as you may have noticed, it's kind of a very low-level language to program in, and you don't want to directly have to implement something like deep learning on that. So, well, uh, yeah, there are a few implementational difficulties. Firstly, there are more internal variables than there are physical registers, so we get around that by... Uh, packing five uh, floats, essentially, each one using 10 digits of a 50-digit variable. So there's a lot of internal messing around with packing and unpacking data to allow it to uh, fit in memory. Also, it's a low-level language. So uh, if I go back to uh, the code, this CF question mark one is a conditional jump forwards by one instruction. There are no labels or anything like that, and all references are basically the number of line num uh, lines to jump forwards or backwards. So uh, that's quite horrible. Another thing that's horrible, memory isn't addressable. So if you want to have an array that uh, occupies, say, registers, uh, 200 through to 400, you'll have to explicitly have, uh, if you're indexing the array, something like, oh, if this value is 0, read from register 200. If this value is 1, read from register 201, etc. And it's incredibly messy because it doesn't have addressing. And uh, Babbage hadn't even conceived of a stack because the analytical engine, well, was designed for much simpler programs than uh, deep learning. Either way, we need a program to write the program. So, uh, well, this took place in several phases. So firstly, writing a compiler to implement a subroutine stack uh, and uh, allow jumping to labels and returning from them. Once all of that was sorted out, we were left with a language that possible but annoying to write in and basically still due to the lack of memory addressing uh, it would take too long to write the program manually so uh, it took a couple of thousand lines of python code to actually write the program and when it's all expanded out it fits on 100,000 punched cards this is without the training data, so every additional image of a digit, you need another 40 or so punched cards, roughly, uh, 25 for the data, then a few of us for things uh, to do with jumping into subroutines and things. Uh, even on the emulator, it runs very slow, uh, one image per second, so, uh, yeah. I then tested it on a training set of 2,000 images. Worryingly, I only managed to get this working at 3 o'clock in the afternoon today. So uh, it was quite rushed, and it was very fortunate that it did actually work. Uh, in fact, the last time I checked the progress by SSH into it from my phone, uh, it's got up from the theoretical result of 10% accuracy that you get just by randomly guessing digits up to 30% after a few hours. So uh, assuming it is correctly implemented, it will reach 98.5% or whatever in several days' time. Or if you were running this on the actual analytical engine, uh, several centuries' time. But yes, also, as I say, it was generated by a mess of Python and Bash scripts. So basically, don't expect this book to be coming out anytime soon. Uh, anyway, uh, I'd like to acknowledge various people who have been invaluable in uh, this effort. So uh, obviously, Babbage and Lovelace. Uh, Sidney Padua who uh, wrote a book, uh, a comic book actually, uh, about the life of Babbage and Lovelace, although it's slightly fictional, as in they do end up building the analytical engine and they start using it to, sol uh, to fight crime and various other things. Uh, it's well worth reading. Uh, John Walker as well uh, was the person who 
uh, designed and programmed the emulator. Uh, Julian Brown, Tom Webster and Simon Rawls, uh, at least two of whom are in the audience tonight, uh, helped designing the compiler. So uh, Julian Brown, for example, had the idea that to index an array, you can do that by sort of a binary search. So it only takes logarithmic time to access an array instead of linear time. So, uh, yes. Also, Tim Hutton, Deepa Shah, and Jay Demanda Laporte, who also came to the hackathon for, yes, baking organization and enthusiastic support. And even though it's not here yet, I will be uploading the source code and these slides into this repository. And if you have more questions than you have time for tonight, uh, a few of us are going to have dinner at St. John's Chop House, so you're more than welcome to join us. Any questions? <laughs>